welcome. Welcome. Thank you for inviting us. I think I'm really happy to, to be together here. So welcome everyone. And, um, thank you, Vincent. And <laughs> yes, welcome Vincent, exactly. Yeah, that's, <laughs> thank that's you. That's the most important part, you know, that's, you know, and, and for, for people that is there uh, lurking, uh, we are always looking for speakers. So we are already planning a meetup for June. So. You can send it for for I I don't know where is the website for Pi Ireland, but, but I, I will share our website in the chat. So if you want to to propose a talk, you can use that link. Um, uh, yeah, I I don't know where my link for proposals is. So just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we can send you some speakers later. <laughs> So I, would, do, I would be very grateful. Thank would, you. Would you like to, to, to introduce the schedule for today? I think. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, I, uh, how do you feel about the, the introduction I gave to you on, on Monday, Vincent? Vincent, did you like that one? Uh, Shall I repeat I, myself? Sure. I, I have to be honest, I don't fully remember, but uh, I, <laughs> I don't remember anything bad. So please go ahead. Yeah, if you don't remember that it's a good sign, yes. Uh, perfect. So Vincent Warmedem um, prefers common sense over hype and it's quite famous around the YouTube Pi Data Search. Uh, he's obsessed about artificial stupidity and not solving the wrong problem. Be aware of the jokes. Vincent is also mad about Pokemons. Tonight we're talking about chatbots though. Actually, we're learning how to deploy our own and uh, so it's very nice to have you here again, Vincent. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the yeah, the, the the Pokemon thing. That's that's always something that somehow <laughs> makes it back. Um, <laughs> so, but but it is something that we're also going to be talking about today. So that I suppose is fine. Um, is this the point in time where I start sharing my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, one, one one small thing first is uh, yep. we're going to have some learning talks at the end. So if someone wants to, so first, if you don't know what's a learning talk anyone doesn't know what's a learning talk, it's five minutes that you can talk about whatever you want to. So you have five minutes. So if you're talking about something really good, you have five minutes, that's really good. If you are talking about something that is really boring, it's good for us because it's only five minutes and then it's done. <laughs> uh, so I w I'm going to share a link for a, for a Google spreadsheet and then if someone wants to 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 give a, a little talk, you, you just, you need to put your, you have to put your name there, that's all. Uh, so I'm going to share that in the, in the chat. And yes, so Vincent, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, host disabled attendee screen sharing. So I think I need, uh, a second. Yes, sorry, again. I can try again now. Yes, that seems to be much better. And we are now in. I think we, you should be able to, everyone can see the purple slide here. Yes. Okay, good. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Vincent and today I will be building a chatbot with you uh, that you can talk to on the command line. Um, and what I'm going to do, this is going to be active workshop style. So I'll be typing and everyone here can just go ahead and type along. And what I'll be doing is I'll be having uh, two co-pilots and that way I will be able to sort of look at them and if I'm going too fast, I'll know. But definitely feel free to ask any questions in the chat. There will be like 10 minutes in between and I'll read your questions. And uh, that way we get to have like a, a fun, meaningful uh, conversation and we can actually build something together. Um, first things first though, um, hi, my name is Vincent um, and I am a research advocate over at Raza. That means that I sit between the developer advocate team as well as the research team. I help out both teams and my main goal is to uh, teach NLP algorithms so that people understand what sort of systems we're building such that we can have this open source chatbot tool uh, that you actually want to push to production. And uh, it's that pushing to production bit generally that uh, I just want to talk about very briefly because I'm sure you might have heard this thing called deep learning and uh, it's taking over the world, also certain chatbots. So what I would just like to briefly do is uh, go to this link and I guess I can share that at least in the, uh, let me th just check, I can go to chat here. So that uh, everyone in the Zoom channel can currently uh, go there just to have a play with it. 
but if you're joining online, it's uh, confai.huggingface.co. Uh, so c-o-n-v-a-i.huggingface.co. And this is a web app uh, that was made by the people at Hugging Face. And it's actually quite impressive what they do. Uh, but this is a state-of-the-art conversational AI that we can sort of talk to. And what I'm just going to do is I'm going to talk to this AI, and then we'll start thinking about if this is something we'd like to have in production. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say hello. And someone says, hey, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. Uh, can I buy a pizza? And the reply is, I'm good. I'm a vegetarian, so I cannot eat meat. So I say, okay. Uh, got any veggie pizzas? And then I get the reply, no, but I have a video of a savage. And okay, so we, we kind of see some weird things happen here. So I'll just ask, got a vegetarian pizza? And then the chatbot says, never heard of it. Okay, so obviously this is not a chatbot trained to do the pizza ordering task, right? So that's first and foremost. Uh, second, another thing we should observe is the replies that we get are actually grammatically quite decent uh, and it's able to pick up something that we're talking about, right? So here it is not just grammatically correct, but it understands that we're talking about food. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, impressive things happening here. It's like this, the, the people at Hugging Face are certainly smart people, but this is not something that we're going to put into production. Um, I don't want to have a system that just has a corpus and then is able to reply. I need a system that's a little bit more constrained. I want a chatbot that has like a very specific use case and has guarantees that it can handle that. So as much as state-of-the-art this could be, this is not something that I'll consider to put into production for my enterprise use case. Like I need something that has just a little bit more constraints. And I mean, I work for Raza, so obviously uh, I like to think that the tools that we make facilitate this. But what I would like to talk to you about today is how we've come up with a tool that's still able to use some state-of-the-art machine learning, but is also nice and constrained, and that's something that you can actually deploy. Um, <clears throat> but in order to get there, I just want to kind of explain what a chatbot needs to do. So what I'm going to do is start from scratch. And I'm, now that I think about it, this might actually take a while to install. So before I start explaining how all this stuff works, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Visual Code Studio. And I've got it open like in an empty folder here. Then the name of this folder is this is a demo. And what I'm just gonna go ahead and do here is I'm gonna start a new virtual environment. And I'll just be using Python 3.7. You can also go ahead and use Python 3.6. And by calling dash M, uh, you're calling the VNF module, which is, I believe, now standard inside of Python. And I'll be making a new virtual environment in this VNF folder inside of this. This is a demo folder. So this, this takes a small while. But now I should be able to say source uh, virtual environment bin activate. And now I should be in a virtual environment, which means that I can now run Python dash M pip install Raza. Because this thing takes a while to download. We have TensorFlow and all sorts of other tools that we have uh, as dependencies. So because this can take a while, I figured it would be a good point in time to just run this command. And then by the time I'm done explaining, we'll have Raza installed uh, locally. So just to make sure, did I go too fast here? Just check with the co-pilot. Uh, I think that's okay. Okay. No, okay. I think it was okay. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Oh, so, so we're just pip installing. And while this is installing, I can do a little bit of talking and then uh, we don't have to wait as much. So we're installing a, a whole stack. Well, let's talk a little bit about what that, what that stack is actually supposed to do. So what I've drawn here essentially is uh, an example of what a conversation could be. Uh, the, and again, I'll, I'll just go with the uh, pizza ordering uh, idea. So you can start by saying hello. Uh, and then, you know, there's a response that has to come back. So we say hello back. And then you can say what you want to have happen. So you'd like to order a pizza. And then, you know, the assistant can say what kind of pizza. And then what might happen is that, you know, th there's a train of thought that's happening here. But the user might interrupt by asking a question like, by the way, are you a human? 
And then it will be nice if we have a system that's able to reply to that question, but is also able automatically to pick the conversation back up to where it's supposed to be. Now, th th these are things that we would like the assistant to be able to do. And if you were to then zoom in on some of the Lego bricks that you need in order to build this, I mean, part of what you're gonna need is you're gonna have, need to have some sort of system that can take a sentence that was spoken and maybe detect an entity. At the same time, for everything that's spoken, it'll be nice if we're able to detect an intent. So you can imagine that we have some text and with every single text that the user is saying to us, the user is indicating that they want something. So that we need to do something with that. And finally, given that we're able to detect the intents as well as the entities, well, then we might wanna have some actions that we're gonna take. So for example, here we've got an action where, uh, let's just make that permanent. So here we've got an action where the chatbot has to utter some sort of a greeting. And here we have to specify that the user, hey, wants to start an order to buy a pizza. So in this particular case, we might have to combine the intent with the entity to get the right action to appear here. And, and this is kind of the system that we're interested in building. So we're gonna have a system where we have intents, uh, entities, as well as actions as our primary Lego bricks. So we're gonna have some machine learning models that can handle these three things, so to say. Now, when people think machine learning, they typically think of scikit-learn. Um, at least this is a tool that's very common. When you go to a PyData, there's always at least two talks on this. But the thing with scikit-learn is that typically something goes into your pipeline and then there's one thing that goes out. But if we think about what the chatbot has to do, I mean, it's gonna be different because in scikit-learn, you're just gonna be predicting one thing. But if you look at what Raza has to do, we're gonna be predicting at least three things. So that might mean that if you're a data scientist and you're interested in learning Raza, you're not gonna do your standard thing. Typically, if you're a data scientist, you're gonna read in a CSV file and use a tool called pandas to start analyzing. But that is something that you're just not gonna be able to do here. You're not gonna have enough if you're just gonna load in one CSV file and this chatbot system might need to have a more elaborate scheme for setting all the configuration files, so to say. So the way Raza works, instead of having conversations.csv that we're just gonna go ahead and analyze, instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna use four files mainly that, that will do most of the configuration on our behalf. One of these files is called nlu.md and and I think that this is zoomed in good enough for people, I hope, right? People can see the text? Uh, it's a little bit uh, too small. A little bit too small. Okay, so. Yes. Let's, I, can I zoom in with alt? No, I'm afraid not. Um, I'll zoom in later, but one thing, but, uh, I'll use this for now, but uh, you know what I can actually do, it might actually be better. Uh, let's do that. And what I can then do is just, what I should be able to do is click this and just make it larger. So I think that is going to be slightly better. And then I am hoping that this is then also good enough. So this is, I suppose, just for now, but I think this is better now, right? Yes, that's perfect. Grand. Okay. So I said there's going to be four files, but in particular, uh, let's start with the files that actually contain the data for our chatbot. And, and the hope is that you're going to recognize which Lego bricks that are, are going to be at our disposal. So first and foremost, we have this nlu.md file, and it's just a markdown file, but you might recognize that we're using these two bangs to declare an intent. So you can see that we've got this intent for greeting, for saying goodbye, for affirming. And after we declare an intent this way, also notice that there are these examples. So for greeting, we've got stuff like, hey, hello, hi, good morning, stuff like that. And for affirming, we have stuff like, yes, indeed, of course. And the idea is that this is going to be a conversational Lego brick. Classifier or a machine learning algorithm can use these examples 
to detect, hey, this is the intent that you're interested in. And we're using the markdown file here essentially to just configure that. And I think in machine learning, that's also a nice way to think about it. The data that you feed to your training system, you know, it's kind of like a configuration file. So we should treat data that way as well. So that means that we have these intents, right? That we might be able to use as a Lego brick, but a single intent is not a chatbot yet. You need something of a conversation and a conversation is not one sentence, one reply. The conversation is usually hello, and then a couple of nice words, and then maybe the part of the conversation. It needs to be more of a sequence of uh, dialogue, if you would. And for that, we've got this other file called stories.md. And the idea behind that file is that we can do something very similar, where before we had a name for an intent, we now have a name for a path. And what we can then do is we can say, well, if a user is on the happy path, then the conversation starts by greeting, and then the chatbot has to respond by uttering some form of a greeting. This is the name of an action that the chatbot has to follow. And then if the user says, hey, my mood is great, which again is an intent that we've defined over here, then the chatbot can say, oh, uh, nice, glad to hear that you're happy. Then we have an appropriate action to take there. The nice thing about having stories is that we can also have, for example, whenever the user says that they are unhappy, then we can have two actions follow up on each other. So first we're gonna maybe try to cheer up the user, and then we're going to ask, hey, did this cheering up help you? Again, these are actions that we still have to define somewhere, but at least we have something of a configuration file about how we think conversations should be happening. And the nice thing is, is that we can have branching paths as well. So we might be able to say, for example, if the user says, hey, yes, that did cheer me up, then we can tell the user, okay, I'm happy that you're happy. But if the user afterwards says, oh, but that did not cheer me up, then we can just say goodbye. So this is an, a configuration file we're able to declare, this is how I think conversations should happen. And the chatbot is going to stick to these conversations. It will never really go beyond what you're declaring here. And this is nice because that means that you can constrain the assistant to only talk about things that you like and also in only in the order that you're interested in. Um, so this might be a good time to just answer any questions people might have. So I'll, I'll be looking at my co-pilots briefly now. I don't know if there's anything in the chat as well. Um, th there was a question, but the issue that we fixed that. And I yes, I am having an issue with the installation though. Like it's telling me that it could not find a version that satisfies the requirement for TensorFlow. Are you, do uh, are you doing this in an empty virtual environment? Uh, yes. Yes, I just started. I started a new folder in a new What's... virtual environment. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and what operating system do you have? Windows. Okay, so that should work. Um, mm -hmm. Could you, so, okay, I'm assuming you've tried it twice, right? So, uh, so I, that, that's my <laughs> assumption. Um, one I can thing- try, I, I can try to make a new folder and see if it installs then. Yes, one, one other thing that you could do is you could, uh, I think you're able to type pip freeze and then you'll get like the list and the versions. Uh, you should also see the version of Raza. You could try installing not the current version of Raza, but the previous one. So instead of, uh, I think, 1.10.1, .1, you can try 1.10.0 or something like that. That might okay. uh, help, but uh, keep me in the loop uh, on this. Will do, will do. Okay. Cool. You, you're welcome to go ahead, by the way. Cool. So I hope that we understand that we've got these two files now. So these are two files, and the idea of them is going to be, we're going to put our settings in it. Uh, and this will be like the data settings. There's going to be two more configuration files. Uh, one of them is called config.yaml, and that's where you can declare all your machine learning stuff. We're not gonna touch that today, but I do think it's nice to mention that you can write your own custom Python machine learning stuff and hang that in here. So you're not limited by just the stuff that we give you. Uh, it is an open system, so you can just write your own things. But the other file that we have to declare is this domain.yaml file and that's where we define all of our actions, like all of our replies that we can send back. And this is a settings file where we can also link custom Python functions to. 
So I have some more of these slides, and, but in essence, what, what I'm about to show in these slides is also something I can just show you in the project instead. And what I'm assuming is that most of you will have this installed by now, maybe with like one or two exceptions. But what I would like everyone to then do is if, if they've installed this, what you should be able to do, and I'm, I'm doing it in the very formal Python dash M way, you should also be able to just run pip directly. That should also be fine. But what you should now be able to do is just run Python dash M pip. And then if you're on Linux, you should be able to do something like grab Raza and <clears throat> uh, sorry, pip freeze and then grab Raza, my bad. And then you should see something of a version number appear here. And if everything went well, you should see that we now have 1.10.1. Uh, and again, if, if you're having issues, what you might want to try and do is run Python uh, pip install and then set the version number of Raza uh, maybe to like 1.10.0 and, and maybe move it back down from there. That might be a way to get TensorFlow working uh, on your uh, Windows machine. However, because we have Raza at our disposal now, there's a command that we can run called Raza init. And this command is somewhat heavy. This is not because we're moving all sorts of files around just yet. It's just that uh, we have to preload TensorFlow and all of its dependencies. And that unfortunately is uh, a lot of importing that has to happen in the background. So this, depending on what sort of machine you have, this command does take a small while, but eventually you should see something of a prompt that looks like this. And just to check again, uh, letter size is good here. Uh, one second, sorry. Uh, yes, everything is perfect. Oh, uh, Nico, I think you're muted. <laughs> so feel free yeah, to unmute. Yeah, so I, I was saying yes, but <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay perfect. <laughs> I know uh, like one trillion windows opens in my computer, so that's fine. Okay, no, uh, perfect. Um, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start a new Raza project. So all the files that I've just briefly discussed, they're gonna get generated here. Uh, first thing you gotta do is you gotta give it some sort of path where the project will be created. Uh, I think the current directory is just fine. Um, it is going to complain in my case that this is not an empty directory. That's because there's a virtual environment here, but I think again, that that's fine. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue by pressing return. And the moment I say yes here, you're going to notice that a whole bunch of files have just appeared. So it's done the whole, um, skeleton, like all the files you typically need for a chatbot have been placed. Uh, so there's some stuff in this data folder, but what it's asking right now is if we want to go ahead and train an initial model. And I'm going to go ahead and say yes by pressing return one more time. And what's going to happen now is a whole bunch of machine learning stuff is going to train on your behalf. We have lots of examples in these files over here, and that's a startup project essentially. And we're telling Raza to run TensorFlow stuff on our behalf to make sure that all sorts of machine learning things are trained. So this takes a couple of seconds. It shouldn't take too long, but you see, if, if, you, if you're ever used to Keras, you might recognize these, uh, these training uh, progress bars. And right now, so I, I've not specified if I wanna to speak to the trained assistant, but right now, after we've done this training, you should now see a models folder as well. And inside of that models folder, there's a tar file. So that's the model that we've trained that's all nicely zipped up. And this is something that we can now start talking to. And in fact, it's actually asking us to do that. So it's asking, do you want to speak to the trained assistant on the command line? And I'm going to go ahead and say yes. Okay. And you should now see something that looks like this, something that's asking for our input. What you're also seeing is that Apparently, according to the log at least, we are running a Raza server somewhere on localhost. So you should be aware that if you're using that port already, that you might get something of an error. But we, we are now running a chatbot server and it's going to pick up the model that's in here and we can start talking to it. So we can do stuff like saying hello and it's replying to me, hey, how are you? And I can say, I am very sad. And then it says, hey, uh, there is something here to cheer you up and I, uh, I can, click that image and see what it's all about. Uh, whoops, there we go. Ah, it's a picture of a cute kitten. So that's, uh, that's all good, but let's pretend that I'm still sad. I can say, nope, still sad. 
Hmm. And I can say no. Okay. And now it's saying bye. So this was a hiccup, and we're going to explain how this hiccup got created. But this is a conversation that we just had with his assistant. And what I would like to do now is just have a look at some of the files that generated this and do like talk a little bit about the theoretical stuff I did in the slides and see if we can get that uh, linked with something we see here. Um, very quickly, and again, just to check, um, were there any huge bugs happening when people were trying to do this? No. Are, are, are those any questions? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, that, that, typically, that's a good sign. Yeah. Um, so what I'm just going to go ahead and do is I'm just going to do backslash, backslash stop here. And this is going to kill the service. It's like clean slate back to the normal terminal again. I can type clean and uh, the terminal's empty again. And what I'm just going to go ahead and do is uh, show you all the different files that we have at our disposal and the main ones that are influencing this. So that means that I have this data folder and inside of that data folder, I'm going to open up this nlu.md file as well as this stories.md file. And these were the two files that I was talking about in the slides earlier. I'm just going to have a look at the stuff that's in here. So again, as we saw before, and I'll use the fancy pen for that, we have <clears throat> something of an intent declaration. And this is an intent that has a name. So this is the greeting intent. And we got some examples here. So, hey, hello, hi, good morning, good evening, hey there. And these are all examples. There's also some examples for goodbye. And what we can do is we can just <clears throat> go down and see some examples of uh, intents that are already implemented. So we got, uh, hey, we like to affirm, uh, we can deny, uh, we can explain that our mood is great. We can also explain that our mood is unhappy. Uh, and we've also got this intent that will challenge the bot. So we can have something like, hey, are you an actual bot or a human? And that, that bit of chit chat is also an intent that we have at our disposal. And from a distance, you could say, hey, we're gonna have a classifier and this is the training data per class. That, that's one way of interpreting this. Then next up, we have this stories.md file. And what you might recognize is that the, let's say the first one, this one, the greet intent that we have over here. And again, the name matters. So uh, make sure that the name is an exact match. But you see that this in greet intent is something that we see being used here. So we're actually using this intent. And what that's doing is it's telling our algorithm later, hey, let's make some training data. And here's a path that actually is supposed to happen. So sample a greeting and sample a mood great. And then we have a story of something that you should be able to classify appropriately. So that's how these stories are being used. And we can see the happy path, right? So hello, and then telling you're, you're doing great. We have the sad path. And then there's a path that's just saying goodbye and another path that's just challenging the bot. So this is not like a super large corpus and something that's representative of an actual chatbot that actually goes to production, but it's enough to get started with. And these stories are pretty self-explanatory to the extent that we've seen these uh, greetings and these mood greats before, but we still got to wonder where are these utter greetings happening? I know that's something we, we haven't declared yet. And those you can find in another file. It's not in this data folder, but the file you want to have is this domain.yaml file. And this domain.yaml file is kind of like your config file where you link most things together. So you can see that these are all the intents the system has to be aware of. And you can also add entities here, but the main thing, at least for us now that's important, are these responses. So Remember in the stories file, we had this response called utter greet. If you have a very simple response that's just sending some text back, then that is something that you can just define here in your domain.yaml file. Now we'll see later how we can also add a response here that refers to a Python function instead. That way you can also retrieve some information from a database and use that to respond something to the user. That's very useful. But in very simple text situations, this is enough to send something back to the user. So that also means that if, for example, we wanted to add an intent here, if we wanted our system to be able to learn from that, we'd have to adapt the NLU file to make some examples for that intent. 
we'd have to make sure that that intent is being used in a story somewhere. And typically for that intent, you would need to make sure that we also add a response. And those are the steps that you typically have to follow. So I guess I'll just add an intent here and, and something along the lines of intent uh, talk code. So we're just gonna talk about code a little bit here. And I guess some of the questions could be, uh, what is a good programming language? And because it's the Python meetup, I'm sure we can imagine that we're gonna have a totally unbiased answer here. Uh, so what is a good programming language? Uh, please talk about code. I was expecting PHP. The, uh, <laughs> uh, goodbye. Uh, <laughs> a PHP is also not the worst, I guess. I mean, people may still make really nice apps with it. It's just not my thing, but uh, I don't wanna be the language troll here. But uh, yeah, so like, uh, uh, what is good programming code, 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 code. Okay, so this is not necessarily something that a user would actually tell a chatbot, but let's pretend this is an intent that we are indeed interested in, right? So um, I'm, I'm sure people can come up with their own silly examples here. If you've got two of these examples and the word programming and the word code is in it, I suppose it's good enough for now, but just make sure you've got something of an intent here and I'll wait for like 10 more seconds. But what we're gonna do after is we're going to take this talk code intent and we're gonna add that to a story somewhere. And that, that's kind of the idea. And then we'll also adapt the uh, domain.yaml file and uh, we'll come full circle, that's the idea. So we've got a little talk code thing here. We're gonna go to our stories and file. Uh, and let's, I don't know, <clears throat> let's add that to the happy path, I guess. So. Someone says they're happy, and then the next best thing they do is they talk about programming. That sounds reasonable, right? Uh, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with that. And then I can do something like utter code. So someone wants to talk about code, and then the robot just says something about code back. Okay. And that means that I now also have to make sure that, that intent is added here. So we have this list of intents, and I just wanna make sure that's configured, right? That the robot is aware of all of this. And then the final thing I got to do is I got to have a response here, something like utter code. And then I can uh, add some text here that says, uh, you like code, give Python a spin. Uh, something like that. And, and, and again, this is not like a super enterprise ready, mega awesome chatbot we're going to put to production, but it's just to come full circle, add an intent. And that's kind of the idea. So, Assuming everything went well, what I should now be able to do is just type Raza train, and then it should be able to detect, it's doing some hashing tricks, uh, but it should be able to detect that you've changed some files, which should be enough for it to say, hey, we got to retrain this thing because there's new information available. So if you type Raza train now, um, this is the same command that ran when we were doing the initialization, so to say, but this should give the whole, yeah, so I'm just going to scroll through the logs. It's saying, hey, uh, this thing has changed, this thing has changed, this thing has changed, right? Uh, retraining this whole thing. And then you can see the, the, uh, the progress bars are back and you know, the, whole, the whole thing is training once again. Uh, so while that's running, uh, John just asked if you have to put exactly the same question in it for you to know the intent or if there is some NLP in the middle. Um, so definitely, uh, you can imagine that there is some NLP stuff that we do uh, on the Raza side. Uh, and I'll go in, I'll mention some of those, I'll, I'll, how about this? We'll just check if this works. And if that works, we're gonna see if we can break it. Uh, and when we're breaking it, I can start explaining why we might be able to fool it and that sort of thing. And hopefully that segue is gonna be giving you the insight you need. But um, like the machine learning stuff we do here in the background, I can talk about that for ages. Uh, so <laughs> in, in the interest uh, for the workshop, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that in a segue. Uh, but I think on most machines, uh, we should now see that indeed this thing has trained. So that means that we should now be able to say Raza shell, and then uh, we should be able to talk to our system again, and hopefully we get to see some sort of changes. Okay, so we can type hello again. I can say, uh, good. Okay, and now I can say, uh, talk to me about code. 
And it says, you like code, give Python a spin. Okay, so it's able to detect this intent. I, I, I don't want to claim any bragging rights because this is a relatively simple use case, but we do see that we've come full circle and we, we made this thing work. But let's now see if we can break it. I mean, this is always the fun part, right? So the question kind of is, how does this system currently work, right? Um, and if you want to know how the system works, what you can do is you can open up this file called config.yaml. And like, it helps if you're uh, aware of some of the NLP algorithms. This, uh, this file can get quite in depth. Like we do assume some knowledge of machine learning. So I'm not going to bore you with too many details. But one thing that I hope you recognize is that, uh, hey, there's this thing called pipeline and there's these objects in it that have a name. And I hope that you can imagine that these are all references to Python objects that we've defined ourselves. And you can totally also add your own here. That's perfectly fine. But a small hint here is that we are generating machine learning features via something called account features vectorizer. And to put it in layman's terms, essentially what that does is we, have, we take a look at all the words that happen here. So for example, we have the word what, we have the word is, and we have the word a. And effectively what we do is we make sort of a hash map. So you can say that what, uh, that refers to index uh, 1081. And the word is, uh, that refers to index uh, 96 or something like that. And eventually you can look at this one blob of text and you can represent that as this array of numbers where most of the arrays are zeros, except for when an index of that array uh, has been mapped appropriately. And that way we can do some sort of mathematical tricks that says, ah, given that we see this word, how likely is it that we're then dealing with this intent? Roughly, I can argue that this is what's happening in the background right now. And we're not just doing that for all of these separate words, we're also doing that for all of the uh, bigrams within the word. So for what is good programming. And we do that usually, and that's a setting we hardly see uh, people turn off because this allows us to also be somewhat robust against spelling errors. If someone made that makes a misspelling, then we just repeat this trick, uh, sorry. If someone makes a spelling error, then we just repeat this entire trick for these bigrams, and then we're still quite good most of the time. Unfortunately, the system is not perfect because one thing that we can do is we can maybe come up with a word or a bigram that it probably never saw before. So whenever I talk to a chatbot and I wanna break it using two characters, Usually the word yo is pretty good because yo is one of these greetings that eh, the typical domain expert doesn't think of when they're greeting. And what's up is also like one of these weird greetings that people on the internet actually kind of throw at chatbots. So let's just see what happens. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I would argue that's the exact opposite of what I was trying to achieve here. So first and foremost, one thing I just want to admit upfront is that our chatbots are never going to be 100% perfect. And it's definitely going to be this game of, hey, do we have the right machine learning model? But also, do we have the right data available here? Because in this particular case, I could argue that the error here is not our machine learning setting. It's just that we only have these six examples and yo is just clearly missing. Right? That, uh, I, I would argue this is more of a data problem than an algorithmic one in this phase. So what I'm going to show you is a feature of Raza that just makes it a little bit more fun to try to break your bot. Um, and while you're breaking your bots, you're also making new training data available, which I think is a nice little double whammy win. So to get there, I'm just gonna stop this Raza shell for now. And instead of typing Raza shell now, I'm going to use a different command, Raza interactive. And it's a similar shell, but we get a little bit more information and we are also able to correct the assistant when it makes a buggy error. So we're gonna see if we can fix yo from here. And again, it takes a while because it has to load all sorts of things and uh, note that it's also detecting that there is uh, an old model available so we don't have to retrain. That's something that it's detecting. But what I can do now is I can type uh, yo and then we're just gonna see what it gives me back. So yo, enter. And now the NLU model says, hey, we've classified yo with the intent to deny. 
And it's wrong, but I think the reason why I picked goodbye before is because we were at the end of the conversation, which is why goodbye might be a little bit more likely. But in any case, deny here is bad. That's incorrect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to type the letter N here because that allows me to say, hey, it's, uh, it's wrong. And then we can see what, how, the, how the confidence is sort of spread. So all the numbers you see here should sum up to one. And if the number is high, that roughly uh, translates to somewhat high confidence that indeed that's the intent we're looking at. So deny is wrong. Goodbye is also wrong. We're going to select greeting instead. Now it's also asking us to mark entities, but we don't have entities yet. So I'm just going to press enter here. That's fine. And now it's, uh, you can see the full history of the bot. And I'll just make this a little bit bigger. So the bot wants to run utter greet now, and I can say that's correct, yes. Um, so, so far this conversation looks accurate. Uh, and now the bot wants to run action listen, and that's also correct. We have to wait now for new user input. Uh, and now I can ask the question, are you even a human? Are, yeah, are you a human I think is also good. Are you a human? And now it's saying, hey, your NLU model uh, translates, are you a human with the intent bot challenge? And there are no entities, this is correct. I would argue in this case, yes, that went quite well. So it can utter that it's a bot, that's also correct. Now it wants to listen again, it's also correct. Uh, now you can say talk code to me. It's kind of the final thing. Talk code, also correct. Utter code, also correct. That's interesting, yeah. So we can look at some of the probabilities here. All this stuff is interesting. This is all correct. Okay. So far, so good. We've been able to correct the assistant a little bit. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do control C, but I'm only going to do control C once. It's kind of important because if I do control C now, I get this nice little sub menu and the sub menu says, Hey, I want to undo the last thing I did. I can start fresh again. But the main thing that's of interest for now is this export and quit. Because what we're able to do now is we're able to say, hey, that conversation that I just had with my assistant, uh, I would like that conversation to now appear in all the files that I have above. So this is like a data set that might correct the original behavior that we had before. So it's gonna export the stories. I'm gonna say, yeah, do that. It's gonna export to the NLU file. I'm gonna say, yeah, let's do that. And it's gonna export to the domain file. And I'm gonna say, yeah, let's do that. And now, if you were to go to the nlu.md file, I think we should see yo appear here now. And I think if I'm gonna go down, talk code to me is now also something that appears. It depends on what you folks typed, of course, but uh, we see some stuff appear here, so that's good. And if we go to the stories, if you scroll all the way at the bottom, you should now also see this interactive story appear here, where first we greet, then we challenge the bot, and then we talk about code, which is exactly the conversation that we just had. Now, this will be more and more interesting the more and more, uh, more of a chatbot you're making that has like a substantially longer dialogue, right? So the example here is quite silly, but I hope that uh, if you're gonna get more complex and complex, this kind of interaction is kind of nice. It's nice to be able to talk to your bot and immediately when it makes a mistake, you're able to correct it. You get more training data, you can retrain, and that loop is kind of nice. It's nice to be able to do that locally at least. Um, but finally, one thing that's also nice to point out is that we now, um, if we would have added a intent here, that's also something that you can do. You can say, hey, this uh, is a completely new intent. It is also able to update your domain.yaml file. And in this case, it looks like it hasn't, haven't, hasn't really done that yet. So, so far, so good. We are now adding features to this chatbot. Now, one thing that's interesting and that's something that you typically don't see in machine learning projects. So one thing that's interesting about this is that these files, this NLU and this config and all of this stuff, we can add that to Git, right? So that means that we kind of have data as a configuration file, but that also means that other people can quite easily collaborate. I can basically say, hey, here's this open source chatbot. Uh, and if there's an intent missing, or if you come up with some good examples, then you can make this assistant better, right? So that you can do some collaborative things in here that you wouldn't typically do in most machine learning projects. And that the nice thing about that is that also in terms of thinking about open source, 
At Raza, we can think a little bit more broadly about what open source means. So I'm just going to go to a browser. And what I'm just going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go to Google, I guess, because it's the easier way to find it. And one thing we can do now is we can type Raza, and I think NLU data. Oh, that should do it. And maybe let's add GitHub as well, because it's a Git repo. And then what should be your first hit is this Raza HQ slash NLU training data repository. And I'll just zoom in a bit here so people can see this. Um, and the idea is uh, what we are also sharing are data sets that you can use as a starting point. So if I were to go to the small talk folder, for example, and I were to open the NLU file that's in there and I'll just do the raw file, so zoom in again, then you'll see that we also have just have some intents here that you can just go ahead and copy that are appropriate for greeting. Uh, same thing for goodbye and same thing for affirming, et cetera. Uh, and what we're trying to do now is just get this community of people uh, together to generate these sorts of files and to add more of these examples, but also for different languages. So for Spanish, for, for lots of language people speak in India, and this is also kind of a way that we can help people make better chatbots. Just make sure that we have better data sets available. And that's like, and, and there is something about that I think is quite nice. It's not typical in a scikit-learn package that you can share some data and that will make all of your scikit-learn pipelines better. But what we can do is we can actually share some data that actually arguably uh, is something that most chatbots are gonna find quite useful. So definitely if you ever are going to consider making your own, uh, give this a Google and you'll find good training examples for your use case. And if there's stuff missing, reach out to me and I'll gladly help you uh, find the right repo. So this will be a good time to have like a small breather and to maybe also have some people ask questions, I think. But so far I hope uh, we kind of get the drill. We, don't, we aren't write, writing any Python but we are doing some stuff in these configuration files and there are some interactive tools and we can build a chatbot for the command line to the extent that the command line is essentially already kind of an interactive environment, but we can now add some natural language to it. So let's just have a breather and maybe get some questions in. So I'll open up the chat. I think there's one question here from Sergey. Yes. He's asking if you can load so if you can use CSV files as I intend so to replace the markdown, I think. So uh, we have some tools that allow you to take your CSV file to get it into this markdown format uh, or into a JSON format that like eventually what we do is we take the markdown, give that to JSON and that will be picked up by our internal stuff. Um, but we do think you're gonna need multiple files. So it's gonna be really hard to have one CSV file that has all of your NLU stuff as well as your stories.nd stuff. But we have some translation tools that should be able to help you. Um, so one, uh, there's a question about stories.yaml. Note yes. that there is no stories.yaml file. There is only a stories.nd file. And the, but the question about, asked about it is a good one. So the question is, um, how does this relate to chatting to the chatbot? And it's actually a little bit subtle. We have a couple of systems inside of Raza and very, very generally, there's three. There's, like, there's way more, but like generally, I guess I can say there's three. There's a system that is able to take text. Let's have that permanent. So there's a system that's able to take text and then that goes into the system and then what comes out is an intent label. And these are like intent classifiers. So we, we call this a classifier typically. And there's another system that can take text and we call that an extractor typically. And what it's able to then tell you is, hey, was there an entity in the text that you've just sent me? So like a reference to a person, reference to a building, and then it can take the uh, subselection of the tokens for that. After that, we have one uh, system and we call that a policy. And the policy doesn't take the last utterance as input. Instead, it will look back for the last, let's say 10 actions. The idea behind this policy mechanism is that we're able to say, hey, what sort, what's the current state in the dialogue? And you can kind of imagine it as a time series like model. 
because we're looking at not just a previous time step, but multiple time steps back in order to help predict what the next best action is going to be. So in the use case of a pizza bot, you can imagine, hey, someone just said, I want to order a pizza. So then we're in that dialogue process of getting the pizza ordered. So I'd like to know the size of the pizza and what flavor, et cetera. But then if someone suddenly asks, hey, are you a chat bot? Then I need to respond first, yes, I am, but then immediately pick up the conversation where I left it. And that's why we need this policy. Very often conversations aren't one-to-one -one mappings from intents to actions. It's a little bit more subtle. And that is also why the stories that ND file is rather important because this policy mechanism is trained using these. So, and again, uh, and if you're interested in how the system technically works, uh, uh, part of my job is to maintain this YouTube channel called the Algorithm Whiteboard. If you type Raza, something like algorithm, you'll see my name appear, a uh, white board. Uh, and then you're gonna get uh, videos that look a lot like the doodles you see here. Uh, and I kind of go in depth explaining how these policy mechanisms work. So if you're interested in more of the machine learning things that happen here, uh, give this a Google and then uh, you should get a nice little repo with information. Um, there's another question about, uh, hey, how do I implement a web interface? Uh, is that possible? Um, it's t it totally is. Like uh, the idea is right now we're just talking to the shell, but you can totally also talk to Slack and we have channels, so to say. So there are multiple endpoints that we can integrate with uh, and send these utterances to. Uh, we support Slack, Telegram, WhatsApp. There's, a, I think Facebook, there's a bunch of them. You can go look that up. Um, and there, we definitely also are able to send that to any front end. Uh, it does depend a little bit on what front end you like, like the, the text box and how that generates. Uh, that is something that you will have to figure out on your own a little bit, uh, but there are open source frameworks that you can go ahead and use for that. These are maintained by the community. Um, so the, the, when you are saying uh, um, uh, about Telegram or Slack, that means I can build my own boat, run that in some computer and connect to my, my Telegram channel or Slack channel. Yeah, so I'll show you uh, this other tool that we have called Raza X at the end. The idea is that's a labeling tool and you can also deploy quite easily. You get this web interface. But usually, right, if you have your own website, say uh, your coolblue.com or what have you, uh, then you typically have a very specific front end. And it's quite hard for us to integrate with every single very specific front end, mainly because in JavaScript land, there tends to be a new one every day. Um, so we can send everything back with JSON. You can write it however you like. It's fully open source. We've got Kubernetes deployments for you, uh, but some of that integration work is something that at some point we cannot generalize. So if you're doing stuff on the front end, do be aware there's usually like a little bit of integration work you have to do, mainly to get the components attached. But uh, all of our stuff runs in Docker typically. Nice, that's super nice. Well, we we, we, like, to, we like to think so. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think, so, so I'm seeing, I really like, my experience training uh, neural networks is usually it's not easy, but mm -hmm. I, I really like how you have this uh, wrapper that is doing all the job for you. So that's really nice. I have a question about the interactive mode. Can, yep. do, do, you, do you think that it would be possible to, to, to use, to teach to the bot, but talking to the bot, like in a production? So I'm not thinking, forget about the business, I'm thinking like in a community bot. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I, I remember like more than 10 years ago, we did a bot for the IRC channel for Python Argentina. And it has a really nice <laughs> Old school, I like it. Uh, <laughs> so, but this bot is, is still running. So you can go to free node and go to the Python Argentina channel and talk with Lalita. It's a, I think it's using Twisted, so it's really old. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but then one feature that I like is like, someone to speak to the bot and the bot says, I have no idea where it is. I don't understand this command, something. Of course, it's not, uh, it's not intelligent. So it's <laughs> and, and then we had a feature that if an admin will talk to the bot, it will say, you have to say, and then a string. The next time that a person will ask the bot the same question, the bot will reply with the string that you, you, will, you were teaching. It. Oh, so oh, we, you can definitely do stuff like that. Um, yeah. So we've not talked about that yet, but uh, the next thing we probably want to do, right, is to have custom Python code here, because maybe you want to interact with the database. 
And it will be nice that maybe there's this, uh, so we have this concept called slots. They're like entities, but they're long lived. So one thing that we can do is, hey, this user, uh, authentication is something you have to do, but hey, this user is not talking to the bot. What's the user status? If the user status is high ranking officer, then we're polite. And if it's a low ranking officer, uh, we make PHP jokes. I don't know, something like that. Um, but you, you would solve that by writing custom Python. So, so everything I've shown you so far, I hope these are convenient Lego bricks. You can do some conversational AI with this. But in real life, you will, of course, write your own custom code because you want to interact with something of a database at some point. Uh, um, and the way that we set this up, just talking a little bit about production, is uh, everything that we're doing right here and right now, uh, if I were to draw that into a nice little containerized box, uh, I would argue that we are now doing the Raza natural language understanding stuff. And the way that this would work is you would have this other container that has all of your actions. And the ki kind of like cloud functions, but we prefer containers. And the idea is that if Raza NLU detects, all ah, right, this is a custom action that I'm about to run, then all the information that's known to me is gonna be sent in a JSON blob in this direction. And then you can tell Raza, hey, I want you to show an image or I want you to just send some text or give the user a form. Um, but that is, that is the interaction. You're gonna have two separate containers so that also means that in terms of scaling and security and stuff, you can figure everything the way you like. Uh, that, that's the idea at least. Uh, any quick questions about this? Because I think the next thing that might be good to do is to just have like a maybe four minute break. Everyone just have a breather, uh, get like a drink, uh, coffee or whatever. And then when we're back, I can show you this open source chatbot that I'm building. And then we can also talk about this custom Python integration stuff. Because that's a nice feature to at least address in this group, I think. Uh, so I any think that's a great idea. So if there is no questions, we can. Okay. Now, so if there's no questions, uh, everyone, let's let's just have like a couple of minutes of break. Everyone can now have a breather. Uh, I'll be here just looking at the questions that come in, as well as okay. the PHP jokes, and then. Uh... <laughs> yeah, there is there is a really good one. So. Yeah, there's a couple of them, but so I'll be here. But then let's let let's all come back in like three minutes or so, okay. and then uh, okay. we'll get started. Okay. Thank you. I, I will I will I will use the time to say that we are going to have. A uh, learning talk. So, if, so far there is no learning talk. So, if someone wants to do one, there is a space. Um, oh, I'm totally going to sign up for one. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I did for one. So. <laughs> <laughs> nah. So the. I'm going to talk about that. Nice. I think it's also a good time to remember that EuroPython is happening in July. That's digital now, right? Yes. Yeah, it's going to be online. So, and there is a call for proposals because... Uh, is it still open? Is, I thought it was open till Sunday. No, but they, no, they yeah, it reopened it. So. Okay. But I think we closed again, no? We closed already, I think. Like the third one for uh, Asian countries. Is it open? Oh, no, yeah, you're, you're right. That's, yeah, so because uh, based on some experience in you know, other online conference, we saw that we can, it was possible to open a call for proposal for people in Asia, Asia and Americas. So it's going to be a long, uh, Two really long days. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, I think it's already like 100 talks. So that's that's going to be interesting. How many and tracks? Three or four? So, so I far think it's, it's four. Yeah, I, I don't know if the four one is already open, but yes, yeah, three or four tracks. That's, uh, uh, so that's two days, and then it's two days of uh, sprints. So that's. I think it was, it's going to be really interesting because it's a completely different format. Uh, they, they are going to have like a Discord uh, channel. So everything is going to be happening there. And then uh, Zoom is going to be the, the support for the video. So that's, that's for my team. Yeah, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of work going into setting up the Python channel, but it's, it's getting super cool. Like we're quite, we're quite happy with the, the results so far, I think. 
And yes, it's closed, my dear. It closed last Sunday. The call for proposals. Oh, yes, okay. I, I so I remember proposing to like a few talks on Saturday because <laughs> in my calendar it said Sunday it's closed, Vincent. You gotta do it now. Uh, did you get? Did you? I get a chance to have a look at the the talks there already. There. Like yeah, so there's, was... a, there's, there's a couple of good ones already, like, but I think there's like a two-tiered thing, right? So they're saying, mm -hmm. hey, there's a couple of talks that are already accepted, but there's a couple of slots left, and that's what this second CFP was for. That's the impression I got, right? It was the third CFP, to be honest with you. It was oh. the third one. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, okay, so some number larger than one. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the third one was because uh, you guys watched the remote pizza, and there was loads of people that was, uh, were like, for that, that time, um, there would be a lot of people like online. So they're mm. like, well, maybe we should just open another, another couple of proposals, right? It, that, that's what happened, wasn't it, Nico? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's the, the second, the second uh, call for proposal was for, for um, people from the Americas, Asia. So that, that, that was, I think that was the idea. But I, I I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be my first ever Python, so I'm, I'm a bit, I was a bit sad because I, you know, one of the reasons I moved uh, to Europe was to to be able to travel and to go to conferences, <laughs> and so <laughs> that's happening online now. Well, I will uh, say that I, I can definitely, uh, and I, this is especially true if you're not from Europe. But the, one of the benefits of being in Europe, especially Amsterdam. Uh, is that it's quite easy to like sit in a train for a couple of hours and then people speak a different language and the vibe is super different. Um, yeah. Like you have to you have to sit in the train for a while before they speak start speaking Spanish again. But uh, like Berlin definitely super close by, Belgium super close by, London super close yeah, by. That, so uh, Dublin. Uh, so th there is a lot of things. Yes, for sure. So if if you travel from Buenos Aires five hours by car, you can you can reach my town in Argentina. And if mm -hmm. you travel five hours here you can go to Paris so yes that's, that's a big difference <laughs> yeah yeah and, and there is a lot of things happening here so like conferences so you that way that's, that's super nice it's, it's a lot of diversity but yes so online conference now that's a new thing and and for Euro Python I think it's, it's, it's going to be pretty really nice yeah uh, it doesn't seem like um, Python Ireland wants to do online for this year so apparently, if we don't do present it's, it's gonna be cancelled. But it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I, now I we are we're five minutes already past. Okay. Well, so then um, I'm assuming that people are sort of drizzling back in. Um, <laughs> hard to verify looking at the chat, but because it's all silent. <laughs> but I, but I, uh, let's assume, are you all there? Yeah. Like uh, let's let's assume that at least for now. Uh, and what I'm just briefly going to go ahead and do uh, is I'm going to type something into Google. Uh, Pokemon Demo Bot Raza. And that is not giving me the hit I'm interested in. Uh, so instead, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go to uh, github.com slash Raza HQ, uh, capital R, capital H, capital Q. And then I have this search bar over here, which will search everything inside of Raza. And I think if I type Pokemon in there now, you're, you are going to see not one, but two Pokemon demos. Uh, you'll want the one on top. That's the one that's most recently updated as well. So Pokedex-demo Raza HQ. And this is just a Git repo. And you might recognize, hey, the data folder and hey, the domain.yaml file. So this you know, starting to look like a Raza project. And then when you scroll down, you see this lovely little, little logo of Pikachu saying something about Raza. Uh, but the idea of this chatbot is, uh, I uh, think it will be super fun if I don't make a chatbot on my own, but I do it kind of community style. The main reason for that is uh, I'm in no mean way or capacity a Pokemon expert. Uh, like, uh, I guess I played it when I was a kid, but um, I figured it might be fun because there's a bit of a niche crowd. If some people who are interested in chatbots can make something that the average Pokemon fan on Reddit finds useful. That seems like a fun little challenge. Uh, not just from a technical standpoint, also from a, uh, and that's the thing that I find more interesting, from a conversational design uh, perspective as well. Because I have no idea what sort of features these people are interested in. 
So if we can build this as a community, we'll also get to kind of feel what it's like to actually push a chatbot to production, which is something that not that's kind of hard to do uh, in a community project five, so to say. Uh, but this is something where we can collaborate, we can label together and have something fun that's nice to build. So uh, definitely open source, you can go ahead and, and play with it. And what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna clone this with SSH. So I'm hoping everyone who's here that they're able to find this link. Uh, in fact, what I'm just gonna go ahead and do is copy this link and check it into the, uh, that's, I should have done that earlier, I think, now to come to think about it. But um, you should be able to go there and then clone with SSH. And then this way you'll have all the stuff we've got here locally. And in this particular case, what I'm just gonna go ahead and do, I think uh, just to make sure that we don't get confused, I guess I am just gonna make a new folder uh, called demo demo Pokebot. Uh, pardon, make deer. And then in this folder, I'm gonna do all of the stuff that I'm interested in. And that way I don't touch all the other files and we, I make sure that I'm not uh, confusing, uh, that I'm not touching the wrong files. And to be explicit, what I'm just gonna go ahead and do is I'm just gonna open up a new Visual Studio code uh, in this new empty folder. I'm gonna start up a nice little terminal uh, and I'll do git clone here and let's clone the thing. And I guess the only thing I got to do is I got to make sure that I source the virtual environment that I had earlier. Because that, that's the part where we had all of our Rasa stuff installed. It'd be kind of a shame if we had to reinstall all that stuff again. But, uh, but again, like the main thing that, that we have now is we've, we've done this cloning thing. And that means that we have all these new files at our disposal here. So I'll just give it like, an, uh, like a good two minutes, wait until people might have some bugs. But the, the main uh, end goal at the moment would be that uh, we are still in our virtual environment with Raza and we've just git cloned this project. Then we can have kind of a look, see what, uh, what's in here. Okay, so all silence, so and, hmm, but so far so good. So yeah, okay. yeah awesome. I'm downloading. So. <laughs> you're uh, you're able to be on Zoom, but uh, this repo takes a while to download. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's, uh, I, I'm installing raw sign and you build so that's why. Ah, okay, so that that definitely will take a small bit, but let's let's look at the files that are in here while uh, while people might be downloading stuff. If you're downloading, it's fine; shouldn't take like hours or anything, but uh, just uh, might save you some time. Anyway. What I'll do is I'll start with the nlu.md file and the stories.md file. I'm just gonna have a, just a glance at all the stuff that's in here. And you should recognize that uh, this project also started by calling Raza init, because a lot of the stuff that we started with are definitely in here. It's just that I have this one intent called demand joke. So I got this intent uh, that's asking like, hey, could you give me a Pokemon based joke? I figured that will be kind of a cute feature, right? So hey, you're a Pokemon fan, you want to get a Pokemon joke. That's a bit silly. But then again, this is even if you're making a chatbot, it would be nice if you can add like one or two intents that makes a person laugh, right? So adding a joke feels like an okay thing to do. So you know, I, 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 I went to thesaurus.com and I made like a whole lot of these examples. So I, I like to think that the examples that I have, they linguistically cover a lot of ground. So this is something that I can uh, definitely live with. So I got this very big intent called the man's joke. And if you look at the stories, you'll also notice that uh, there, there, there is this uh, demand joke, other joke happening here as well. So we're also using this. And what is interesting to point out is the way that this uh, joke is implemented on the domain at YAML side, because the way that I've implemented that joke is different than in all the other cases. Normally you would say utter goodbye and then there's like one thing you send back. But what I've done here is I've said utter joke and then randomly it will pick one of these responses. So that's perfect for the joke uh, use case because what I would really hate is if someone tells gets the same joke over and over and over again. And by doing this, it'll just randomly pick a joke here um, and what's nice about this is I've actually gotten a couple of PRs on this. So you as a contributor, you can say, hey, wait, I know a good Pokemon based pun. 
you can make a PR and it's added to the chatbot. And that's also nice about these files, so to say. So that's that's pretty interesting, right? So that, that's a little bit different. We have this uh, this action where we can have lots of these things come in. So that's pretty cool. But we now also have this other intent that's called confirm exists. And this one is a little bit different because you can notice these square brackets here, right? That's something we've not seen before. And we also see that these, these square brackets, so we're sort of saying, hey, Bulbasaur is a special thing. And what sort of a thing is it? Well, it's a Pokemon name. So what we're doing here is we're declaring that, Poke, that Bulbasaur in this case is an entity of type Pokemon name. And this is how in our little DSL syntax, you specify that there's an entity in our text as well that has to be detected. And the idea behind this use case is that someone can come up to you and ask, hey, is, uh, I don't know, Godzilla a Pokemon? And that then the robot is able to say, no, Godzilla is not a Pokemon. Uh, but then if you do give it a proper name, it's able to say, ah, oh, it is. The nice thing about this is it's a nice demo because typically you would need some sort of a database retrieval for this, right? So if you're asking for an address or a headquarters or something in particular, this is a use case where we have to detect an entity, but also we definitely have to detect, uh, but, but, but also we need to have something of a database or a data file where we compare if it exists. And that's the use case we have here. So any quick questions on this? Okay. Cool. So let's have a look at how this, how this is implemented. So we have this intent, right? And if we have an intent, we need something of a response. And as I can confirm in this stories.md file, when we ask for this intent, we apparently would like this action to be able to happen. So check existence needs to happen. And if I look at my domain.yaml file, this, this action check existence, that's not defined in these responses, right? That's not, that's not something that you'll find in that file. What you will find is that this action appears over here. So we do configure the name of the action. It's just that the Python code is something that we cannot handle inside of this YAML file. So that has to be hosted somewhere else. And if you go to this actions.py file, then you will see the implementation. You're gonna see an object here that has a method called name. And you'll notice that the action check experience, the name of this object, the name property or method in this case, right? That is something that corresponds with this. So that's how the link sort of is made. This is an action that actually has a name. And then you can also see that there is this run method on that object. And this object inherits from uh, action, which comes from the Raza SDK. If you in pip install uh, Raza, the Raza SDK is, uh, comes along with it. But essentially what is happening here is just a little bit of logic that says, oh, right, uh, yes, something is a Pokemon or no, I don't recognize the name. Are you sure it's spelled correctly? So checking the database, what I'm kind of mocking here, that's the logic that's happening inside of this guy. So what I would like to do now is show you how this works. But before I'm able to do that, we do have to remind ourselves of this one phenomenon, and that is that we have this NLU box, right, where we do all of our natural language understanding, and any custom Python code should go into this actions thing. So that means that we need to, if we're going to start this service, we will also need to start this service. And that's something we got to do. So the convenient thing about uh, this code editor, if you're using uh, Visual Studio Code is that there's this button here that allows you to add an extra terminal here. So that means that I can maybe start the action server from here. I do need to uh, get my virtual environment activated though. So that's one extra step I suppose you would need to do. But now I've got these two windows in the terminal, right? And I should be able to run, uh, to type Raza run actions. And what this is going to do is it's going to, uh, if you don't specify anything else, it's going to look in the actions.py file for any actions that you've declared. So this should automatically pick up this action. And this takes a while, but uh, no module. Uh, Raza run action. Oh, 
I did spell it correctly, didn't I? Actions. Hmm. Oh, this is fun. Like I've I've never had this bug before, so I can see what's maybe see what's going wrong here. Hmm. You create a new folder. Maybe that new folder doesn't have the yeah. So some something along those lines might be it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, instead instead of running this, I'm just going to run the actual Pokedex folder I've got locally. So everything on your end should be exactly the same. I'll just open up a new Visual Code Studio because I think that might be a bit. I, th I think it might be the folder stuff that I've done. If you're running it locally, does it? Do you get the same bug on your side? I'm not running now. Could you try? So I got an error installing. So I got an error installing TensorFlow. So I'm... Demo gods cast a bolt of lightning. Yes, it does look that way <laughs> a little bit. But uh, I'll be I'll be up and running in a moment. No worries. It's a demo. It has to... It's a demo. Yeah, exactly. And I'm live coding anyway, so I know or that you I'm. You have to create a dot underscore underscore init file in the folder in the new folder. Yeah, that could be. Hang on. Uh, so uh, I think I called this Pokemon demo bot. Yes. And then if I were to run code here, then I've got this new Visual Code Studio. So this is the thing I've got locally, at least. So right. I have made all sorts of weird changes here. So get status. Okay. Get uh, add dot git commit live. Uh, okay, get checkout master. This way I should have everything that you folks also have. I can source this and I can run Raza run actions here. Actions. See if this runs. Okay, it's working on my side at least. So the demo gods, uh, they, they only poked me. They didn't uh, bring me down fully. But uh, I, what I'm just going to go ahead and do is let's make this, this uh, full screen. And let's just open the files again, and we'll be back to where we were. I think it's the folder thing, to be honest, but we'll, we'll, we'll check it out again. So uh, the stories file, NLU, and I got my domain, and I had this actions file. So these are all the files that I had, and Raza Run Actions picks up this file and is running it as a service. And you should also see that it's actually running a server here, and it's running it on a certain port. And if, you, and if you look at the endpoints file, you'll actually notice that, hey, the action endpoint is something that we've configured as well. So, so that means that I should now be able to run Raza shell. Uh, okay, uh, virtual environment, Raza shell. And Raza shell is now going to be trying to communicate with this action server whenever the appropriate action is triggered. So again, we have to, if we look at the stories file, whenever this confirm exists, intent is triggered, and this is the action that it wants to take, that's when this action server over here is gonna get triggered. That's the idea. So I'm just gonna type hello, and it should just be able to reply, hey, how are you back? But now what I should be able to do is I should be able to ask the question, does nine tails exist? And this is literally something that was here as an example. So this is an, an, a, this, it should be able to pick this one up appropriately. So let's see what happens. So we see a whole bunch of stuff happening over here, right? Uh, in the action uh, uh, side of things. And that's because I've got this print statement over here and something like tracker latest message and you can you can kind of see that it's just this json blob with lots of information and numbers but this gives you an impression of the information the action server receives but the main thing that's important here is that it says hey i do not recognize nine tails and that's exactly this bit of text Let's just zoom in a bit that's this bit of text so that's the actual logic code that's running here and because there's a Python object, I hope you can recognize like, all oh, right, so this is where the database checking could happen. We can write custom code for that. So uh, in the use case of the IRC channel, uh, if we then recognize, oh yeah, and this user is admin, then we can update the database. And that way, whenever 
uh, sort of a low hanging fruit user, we can make a PHP joke, like the thing we just talked about. That's some stuff you could handle whatever way you'd like, as long as you can describe it in Python. It is complaining about nine tails not existing. So I am wondering what happened there. Oh, I think, I think it's called nine tails. I think it's a spelling thing. Okay, and now it is able to say, yes, it's a, it's a Pokemon. So, so the action server can be triggered. Uh, that, that's the main thing that, that, that we can see here. And I hope that you recognize that this really opens up a lot of avenues in terms of, hey, we have this machine learning thing, we have these Lego bricks, so that means that we can kind of define the stories whatever way we like. There's some constraints there, right? So we don't get the hugging face thing where we might generate stuff that doesn't make any sense. And we like to think that this is a really convenient set of tools to make a chatbot that actually makes it to production, because that's the thing we kind of care about. Uh, we have a research team, but the main stuff that we like to do is apply research. If we are doing research and it doesn't go to production, it's not really something that we deem super useful. So I just want to make sure that people can ask questions at this phase. Um, something that doesn't anger the demo gods, hopefully. <laughs> people got this working? I, just, I would like to check. I did not manage to get uh, TensorFlow running. So for, I for me, okay. tens I got, I, I'm getting a TensorFlow error. Like uh, there is no, uh, not, it's requiring a version that is not available. That's a, Okay, so that's interesting. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna, could you check this for me? Pip freeze, grep TensorFlow. Yes. Yes, what, so TensorFlow what TensorFlow version did you? In a second. Yeah, no, that, that's the problem. It's no, it's no installing because when I install yeah. Rasa. Right, well, how about this? Could you, could you manually install TensorFlow with this version? What might be happening, I cannot know for sure, is that TensorFlow just did a release. That's yeah, something... Pro probably. Oh, give so me a second. TensorFlow. Mm, let me see if I can install TensorFlow, just, just TensorFlow. Yeah, so just, TensorFlow. So just install so, TensorFlow manually. And that we might yeah, be able to isolate the problem that way. I'm doing that and the version that is downloading is 2.0. Yes, Two, but ah. then... Yes, but then if you try to do pip install Rasa, that's the version that it doesn't want to that it doesn't want to install altogether with the bundle. So, so could you just manually install this version of Rasa? I tried, and then what it gives back to me the sentence that I get back the error. I can post that for you right now on the if chat. You could just post that in the chat real quick. Yes, absolutely. So that's such uh, tensorflow add-ons. That's this guy. Mm-hmm. Huh. Uh, I got the same error. Okay, so that, uh, but then I'm happy to report that it's Google's fault. Um, <laughs> maybe. Uh, one thing that I suppose we could try now is, could you just try to install TensorFlow add-on manually this way? Yeah. After, uh, th just to check if that will help. Okay. Um. Right now, I'm try. I'm installing TensorFlow. And maybe actually, could you just try and pip install Raza? Uh, just for now, just see if if 1.9 alleviates this. And I'm kind of guessing here, right? Uh, you don't mind too much, but uh, it feels like this is the TensorFlow dependency kerfuffle. I think uh, I tried. So I'm I'm trying that now, and it failed before. But I, so I'm trying with 1.9. Hmm, we'll see. I'm downloading TensorFlow 2.2, so let's see. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> that's, that's like 500. And now that two people are admitting they have install errors, suddenly other people are also admitting that they have install errors. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what you said. You're like, yeah, we're going to do this all together. So okay. you see? Um, hmm. Okay, you're still downloading. Yeah, so some, something's telling me this is a TensorFlow specific so wait, thing. Wait. So I did a 1.9 and I got similar error. So this is looking for TensorFlow less than 2.2 and greater than 2, greater or equal to 2.1. And that's not right. So I will copy paste error. 
Mm, yeah, so this so someone said they found this on the forum, and that's uh, indeed somewhat appropriate. But um, this one is old because this one is about installing TensorFlow one point fifteen, which is a bit dated. Um, mm -hmm. I, I based I based the error I get in. So it's Russ at one point nine. He's requesting a version of TensorFlow that's mm. not there. <sighs> It's requested two point two. How come the one point ten requires? Uh, it's, it's, it's less. Yeah, so it's so okay. They, they they removed two point one. I think that's the problem. Oh. So two point one. Oh, it's there. So I'm looking at PyPI. It seems to be here, but let's let's have a read. Could not find a version that satisfies the requirement uh, from Rasa one point nine. Okay. So how about this? I think it'd be nice mm -hmm. to sort of investigate this, but looking at the time, I think it might be nice such that the people who are watching and still sort of keen to learn, that I'll do like the final demo of like the Raza X labeling web thing. I think that would be nice to show. And then we can sort of duke it out, see if we can get all these errors fixed. Yeah, I agree, agree. Yes. That'd be good. Uh, and I, I want to do some debug in the background. Good. Um, <laughs> now, so then uh, what, what I can then do is show you. I've got this. Uh, let's make this a separate window. That'd be nice. Uh, let's remove this away. Yep. So what I'm running now is a, it's an old version of the chatbot. So this is definitely uh, lower tech than what you've got running locally if you've managed to get this running locally. But what you're looking at now is a web app. And this web app is called Raza X. It is not open source, but it is free. Um, the reason behind this is we definitely love it if you are going to use this to make your own chatbot better. What we are less of a fan of is if you're going to run Raza X and then charge other people money for it. That's something that we don't want to do. So the license is not open source, but it is definitely free. So you can go ahead and download this. And the idea behind Raza X is that this makes both labeling as well as CI CD a whole lot easier if you're going to be deploying Raza. So the idea is we have this master button. So that means that any changes on your Git branch, you can just pull that in and you can also push to your Git branch. And then what I've got here are all the conversations that some of my users have had with my chatbot. And that also gives me this user interface where I can just look at some of the training data that I've gotten and I can check, hey, is it able to detect this appropriately? And I can actually do the labeling myself here. Multiple people can log in so we can label together. So I can say, for example, uh, what Pokemons do you know? I guess that's a, someone suggesting a feature in Dublin. Well, that's not greeting, so that's wrong. Um, where's the closest restaurant? Great talk, well, that's a compliment. Uh, what are you? That's also not greeting, that is suggesting a feature. All right, so I, I, can, I can do some labeling here. And what I can then do is I can click this big green train button and what's gonna happen is it's gonna be training a new model from here, which means that I have this button here where I can say which model is supposed to be activated. Now, the main thing what makes this nice is this environment also allows me to share. So I can say, this is a demo and I can say, please talk. And this will generate a link that I can now share. It has to happen in a different browser. But now you can now add that link into this browser I've got over here. And then I have this user interface where I can just really start talking to this digital assistant. So I can say something like, hello. And then the assistant's waiting and let's just zoom in a bit. It says, hey, I'm a Pokebot. I'm a bot that will help you catch them all. Right now I'm only talking a little bit about Pokemon names. My features are being built. Is there anything you would like me to be able to do in the future? So I can say stuff like, uh, tell me everything about the Pokemon card game. All right, so that, that I've now spoken to this, uh, to this chat bot. And what I can now do is I can then, there's a little bit of a delay. What I can then do is look at uh, all the conversations that have happened. And in real time, you can see what conversations actual people are having with your actual digital assistant. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm just gonna share this link really briefly. Uh, this link is probably down tomorrow, but you can have a, a bit of a go 
and I should say the chatbot is not the most stable thing I could come up with uh, in a very short period of time, but uh, you should get an experience of, hey, what is it like to talk to this chatbot? And what's nice is that if you are in an actual user setting, like you're actually about to go live, this Raza X thing helps you with the CI CD, but also with the data. So that means that you can give this to some domain experts and just get an idea of how they're gonna talk to your assistant. So I don't know, uh, tell me Pokemon jokes in the future, maybe that's a feature I would like. And right now I'm using Raza X to just collect some features that people would like to have inside of my chatbot. But the main thing that's epic about this is that when you're generating data the first time, when you're making your chatbot, you can kind of imagine this Venn diagram. Oh, let's draw that again. So you can kind of imagine this Venn diagram. And you're going to make the best model for the data that you've got available. So this is the data we optimize for. But then when you're going to deploy this, odds are that this is the data users care for. And what I see a lot of people do in data science is just pray that this overlap over here is actually big. And that's kind of an issue. Instead, what I think might be more useful is if quite early on, you're able to share them your chatbot via something like Raza X or just some interface such that you can start collecting this bit by bit. The idea being that you probably have no idea how people are gonna use your chatbot in the beginning. You, know, you might have a good starting point and you have to start somewhere, but the earlier you get your new user data in, the more improvements you're gonna be able to make. It's not necessarily the machine learning pipeline. It's usually more of a data problem. Uh, and I'm not drawing this with the mouse. I have a pen for this, uh, but uh, the, thanks for the compliment nonetheless. I was expecting you to lie and to show a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> nah, this, uh, I, I have uh, actually, so I, I bought this Wacom tablet like a month or two ago. Uh, it's 300 bucks. It's actually not the most expensive thing. And it also serves as a second screen. So I can highly recommend it. Uh, but it certainly is a toy uh, and I need it professionally. So I'm able to make the investment. But for demos like this, it is the bee's knees. It is uh, pretty darn cool. Anyway. What's the name of it again? Because like the, you told this me. Tool. Raza. X. So Raza space X. Um, and there, like, there is a way for you to download this locally, but if you go to our documentation page, there is this like one copy paste command and then it basically installs on the VM. Uh, we have all sorts of Kubernetes deployments ready to go. We have Docker compose stuff, if that's your thing. Um, but, uh, but again, the idea is it's nice to have an open source tool and to get that out to your users as quickly as possible. That's, that's the main thing that's important. Um, cause otherwise you're, you're at risk of prematurely optimizing. Mm. Uh, solving their own problem. Yeah. You know, that, that old theme. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, this is the quick demo I wanted to show, uh, folks. I hope that people enjoyed having something of a chatbot on the command line and that they, uh, that they consider this whole Raza stuff kind of interesting. Like that's the, the reason why I'm talking to you about it. Um, but I think as far as demos go and like stuff I really wanted to talk about, like the theory, that's stuff that we've already quite well discussed at this point. So I suppose that there's a few things that we can do now. Like I think answering a bunch of questions will be a good idea. I can also help people with some install issues. Uh, but I believe people also want to do like a lightning thing. Um, so how about we just answer some quick user questions, then I'll do like one more lightning announcement on my side. And then if people still have issues, just contact me on Twitter and I'll help you out. Is that, is that kind of a, a nice balance point? Yeah, I think, I think that works fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. And we'll have a quick so, look at some of the questions. Yeah. Um, I would love to learn and implement Raza X at work for some Q and A stuff on our internal pages. Um, yeah, so um, do you want to do Q and A or do you want to do FAQ? Those are typically sort of two different use cases. Uh, so definitely uh, FAQ is a very common use case inside of Raza and we have some, some components that might help you there. Um, proper Q&A, um, like it, it, if you want to hand it off to an actual human being at some point, then things get a little bit more involved. Um, 
But if there's a question about Rasa X, uh, send, hit me up on Twitter and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you the right documentation pages. I have one question. It's probably a, a not that like relevant, but I was looking at the at the source code of the Pokemon. Which one is it? The Pokemon dem Pokedex demo yeah. you shared with us, and I saw the Pokemon DB.json file. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's indeed a feature for the future that we're making. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you have if you have uh, done anything cool with those features because it's like I've never seen anything like that. Like. All the data from all Pokemons that are on the on the list, like the so, Pokemon names, they're all here. So it might be because my, because of my reputation that I'm aware of it, but uh, but <laughs> it, it, we got that data set off of Kaggle actually. It's not uh, so it's 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 an open data set. You can just go and download it. Uh, one of the really? things that I would be interested in doing with this, um, so it would be nice if you can do like basic retrieval stuff, like hey, uh, give me all the information about this Pokemon, and then we have all the types, we have the entries, and that's something we can do. Another thing that would be nice is that we can also show you the photo and that's where stuff gets interesting. Another thing that would be cool is if we can also have this uh, simulation happen. So you can say, who would win, Batman or Superman? Or in this case, uh, Pikachu or Onyx? Uh, and these are sort of also some of the quirky questions we would like to be able to answer. So that's why we have that data set. Uh, there are also some more experimental features that uh, both myself and the research team are sort of pursuing. So one of the things that we are exploring, and I should emphasize exploring, um, mm -hmm. is it would be nice if you can sort of have natural language translate the SQL, right? It would be nice if we can maybe automate that where we say, look, here's a JSON file, here's all the keys, here's the types of all of them. And then if a user says, give me all the Pokemon that have HP at least 15, something like that, we can just present you with a short list of things that we can retrieve for you. That is an active area of research, so to say. Uh, okay. Again, not there, not quite there yet, but there are some experimental features that we're working on that are in this realm, so to say. Cool, cool. And I also would like to say to you that I just finished the installation of TensorFlow and it worked. Oh, what, what, was, the, what was the trick that worked? Uh, just install TensorFlow separately. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, the reason is that the, if you try to install 2.1, it's not available. They remove that from PyPy. So it's in the it, there is a it's in the website, it's an, but it's not available to the law. So that's why. Hmm. hmm. I've never had that happen to me live yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, but yeah, as a first, like if you're doing live demos, something has to go wrong. So I guess this had to go wrong. But uh, but okay, it's good to know. Uh, at least I'm happy to hear it's not something on our side. Uh, but, no, yeah, five, five. No, you're using TensorFlow, so. <laughs> yeah, so one, so one. I, I suppose there's one thing that's nice to mention there. Uh, I mean, one of the benefits of using TensorFlow, and we we have this like pretty big community, so we have people who are experimenting with Raza. Um, one of the nice things I suppose I do want to mention about TensorFlow, you can compile it down to something quite lightweight. I mean, there's some people who seem to have gotten all of Raza to work on a Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, you, it's nice that you have TensorFlow where you can really get that to a nice little small chunk. Uh, the downside is, of course, it's still a lot of C++ code and some of that stuff might just go wrong and it's a super large project and community that you're relying on. Um, but so most of our research, we like to use TensorFlow for that as the golden standard, but nothing is stopping you from writing your own custom components in Python. If you prefer to use PyTorch and you want to uh, maintain or write your own stuff, you can totally do that. Cool. Cool. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I said it too early. It's not. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, oh, uh, like, ping me on like private message Slack or Twitter or whatever, and I'll gladly help you out. No worries. Thank you. Um, so I guess if, uh, be because I have the impression that there's not too many other questions being asked, uh, one thing I would like to point your attention to, uh, I mean, I'm no longer organizing this. Uh, I've happily passed the torch along to some other lovely volunteers, uh, but you may have noticed that conferences are not happening in real life anymore. But the people over at PyData Amsterdam figured, you know, this was gonna be our fifth year. It is kind of a bummer that we can't do it anymore. So what they are doing is they're turning it into an online festival. The idea being, Maybe not everyone wants to sit behind a laptop all day looking at conference talks. So instead, what they are going to do is they're going to have more of a festival type schedule. So you can imagine on Monday evening, we have something of a keynote. 
And then every day of the week that follows, we have something of a workshop, uh, like a code breakfast tutorial thing that you can watch in the morning. And then in the evening, we'll have two talks that you can li uh, ta listen to. But every day will have its own theme. And this way, you can kind of mix and match and pick the talks that you're interested in. So that's the idea for the PyData Festival in Amsterdam. Tickets are relatively cheap. And if you buy a ticket, then effectively what you'll be doing is you'll be helping fund some open source projects because the proceeds of this will go to NumFocus. So projects like NumPy will still get their support. Just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. If you're into sort of machine learning stuff, then this is definitely a conference that you would like. Um, I cannot announce any of the speakers formally yet, but trust me when I say there's going to be some good names there. Nice. Yes, please share the link. Uh, I can probably share the link later in our meetup. That, that's, that's really nice. That'd yeah, cool. I can. I would totally put the link on the on the video description as well when we upload this on YouTube. Cool. So thank you, Vincent. That was amazing. So I. <laughs> <laughs> that's Yeah, you got. <laughs> you're you're not allowed to have a stage in your house. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah. You you always get super excited with this with this claps. Uh, the, we do this claps every time we're doing. By the end of every Euro Python meeting, there are this claps now. <laughs> is it is this from like a Monty Python episode by any chance or like? Uh, that that. I have to. Uh, that, that's a good idea. It's not for a Monty Python but oh, Okay, that's a... probably probably I can use that. <laughs> I'm I'm preparing for, for 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 to improve my setup for online conferences. So oh then no, then no, 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 yeah then then definitely also add like the Spanish Inquisition and some yeah yeah that's... Some, <laughs> some silly business like that. <laughs> and then every time you announce a speaker, you do like a silly walk. And, yeah. that, that that's something that I'm preparing for. <laughs> so thank you. That, that that was a really nice talk. Uh, super super interactive. So that's pretty hard to achieve. So thank you. Cool. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think we are ready to finish. Um, I are you gonna give us uh, your your lightning talk? I don't know. So I'm going to show. So I, I'm going to show in a second. It's just a small. Can you see a GitHub page in my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so probably no, I don't know if there is a lot of Spanish speakers here, but I'm really happy with this project. Um, so like uh, um, two months ago, no, a month ago, so the 1st of May, less than a month ago, we started this project. And this is the official, so Python, <laughs> the official translation of uh, the, doc, the docs in Spanish. Uh, so there is a long history here, but basically in Argentina we did the tutorial like 12 years ago, but we never did that in the official uh, format. And after the remote visa conference, uh, we started this project. That was just a month ago. And now you can go to doc.python.org. So we are not in the switch because we are finishing some details, but I can show you that if you put S here, we are already there. So you have the tutorial that's 100% translated. And this project is growing a lot. So if you see the numbers, there is in the last month. So the last month is the complete life of this project. So a lot of pull requests, a lot of people working here. So if you speak Spanish and if you want to participate in an open source project, that is easy to start. This is, I think this is a really, really good one because you, you are going to learn a lot on how to create a pull request, how to work with a team, but then the, the, the bar to, to start working is okay. You need to, you need to, to speak Spanish and English because it's a translation, but I think it's a, it's a really good one. And so we have this link in our GitHub and there is a guide that I'm going to show here. Of course it's in Spanish. And it has all the all the points on how to do it. So yeah. So if you're a Spanish speaker, you're welcome. Or if you are learning Spanish, whatever. Okay. 
Yeah, that was a super fast project. Like, I can't even believe from the day that you can put the link on Twitter to the day that you announced that it was finished, the translation. It's like, how many people are working on this? Like, it was so super now fast. Our, our Telegram channel is 57 members. Um, yes, that's amazing. So I, I started with it with some friends and, and then it's impossible for us to follow what's happening because it's, it has life. So that's, <laughs> that's life. So that's, that's, that's how you wish, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So uh, this is, I guess we're finished then, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's all. So thank you everyone. Thank you, thank Vincent, you. that was really nice. Uh, thank you, Nico. See you everyone next time. I don't know, I don't know if we're co-hosting with Python Ireland again, so. <laughs> well, for, next, for the next edition of Python Ireland, we have a um, C Python developer. Uh, with a nice. cool talk on, yeah, nice. uh, I think it's fast API, open API, fast API. I, I don't remember really, but it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool talk. And yeah, just stay tuned. It's going to be on the page as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Vincent. It was a pleasure to have you twice here with us in one week. Thank you. Uh, uh, is uh, Sebastian from fast API talking next? Is, is, did I hear that correctly? Oh, no, 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 it's not Sebastian. So Stefan, Stefan Rito, he's oh, okay. one of the, um, yeah. Okay, I had a beer with Sebastian like a month ago when I was in Berlin. So if you would have had Sebastian, tell him to say hi. Uh, I did not have a beer with the person you just mentioned, so that would be weird. So okay. <laughs> He's from Belgium. So, uh, well, next time you're, if, you're, if you come around here this year and everyone is around, I'll introduce you too as well. Sure, okay, that would be fun. But, uh... But, uh, but again, thanks for having me and everyone have a good night. Yeah, Thank you. you. Same. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, guys. Bye, 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 bye. It was always, like, it was a pleasure as always. Bye, bye.